In today's show, we talk about what we learned from Trailblazers Media Day now that the 2024-2025 season is finally here. Welcome to Locked On Blazers. Let's get into it. You are Locked On Trailblazers, your daily Portland Trailblazers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What? Up world, it's your past first point guard and Trailblazers reporter Mike Richman. You are listening to another episode of Locked on Blazers, part of Locked on Podcast Network, available wherever you get podcasts and also on YouTube. Thanks for making the show your first listen, coming at you each and every weekday, Monday through Friday. So make it a part of your daily routine. Make it your first listen and tell your friends to do the same. It's Locked on Blazers, your team every day in today's show, Media Day Came and went on Monday, September 30th. The Blazers hosted their media day to officially kick off the 2024-2025 season. We heard from basically the principal actors and not a single person more. Uh, uh, Dwayne Higgins, the Blazers uh, president on the business side. We heard from Joe Cronin, Chauncey Billups, and then 10 Blazers players, basically the 10 regulars, the 10 guys I've been predicting would be in the rotation for a couple weeks. Um, <laughs> is that telling? I don't know. I don't. I remember the Kevin Knox saga from a while ago. We'll talk about that a little, in a little bit. Kevin Knox saga from last year. But we heard from the principal actors over the course of about two and a half hours, and... Um, now the season is upon us. They're going to have their first day of practice on Tuesday. You are listening to o- Tuesday, October 1st show. Welcome to October. The NBA season has arrived. If you're a new listener, what up? Welcome. If you're a longtime listener and everyday or shout out to my everydayers. Thanks for rocking with me. Um, we're going to get into it. Uh, I want to talk about Joe Cronin's remarks. We don't hear from him a bunch publicly. Um, and he kind of addressed the where the Blazers are in terms of just like a big picture state of the union and the union is tanking. Um, talked about the, the early stages and the steps. He used the, he used the phrase take steps a lot of times in his addresses. Um, the new, there's some news, some, some, some news. It's mostly Rob Williams related and then odds and ends, some fun stuff that happened at media day. I'll walk you through all of it. I was in the building. Um, if you go listen, if you go watch the, uh, the the interviews posted on the internet you can hear this familiar voice ask a lot of questions in fact many of you probably already have had and heard heard this familiar voice ask a lot of questions um it's good to be back reporting it feels good to be in the back of the swing of the nba season it's it has a real back to school vibe uh where day one is fun and then the, all the other days are a march to the end but i actually like the middle part of the season the 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 marathon of the nba is what gives it beauty for me if this is the early stages of the season, it's also the early stages of the Blazers' rebuild. And Joe Cronin was extremely clear about he not getting out over his skis. He was he was, he was very honest about without saying, "Hey, we're going to lose some games on purpose." Although he did have one quote that strikes me as, "We're going to lose some games on purpose." Strap in. But he was he was pretty candid about how the Blazers just like aren't ready to win. They're just, they're not a team that is equipped to win. And he built the roster. So you better believe there's some intention behind a team that's not built to win. He, he, he during his 15 minutes addressing the media, uh, let me just a real quick complaint. I'll lodge this in the first four minutes. And I won't mention again. Um, there were another 15 questions we could have asked Joe Cronin. They cut off the interview at about just, just shy of 15 minutes. Let him loose. Let him loose. Let him answer as many questions as he feels comfortable with. I understand that the sort of media, I don't know. I understand that media day, the train needs to run on time, um, but let Joe Cronin go last and let it run late if it, if it needs to. Um, but Cronin said, you know, we love where we're headed, but we have to take steps to do that. And that was the theme of his whole ad- of his address. Take steps. Take steps, take steps. It wasn't about what they are necessarily now. It's what they can be and how they get from point A to point to, to point probably Q. Like it's many steps down the road. Um, and I asked Cronin kind of kind of like, where where are they? You know, what's he's been pretty honest about this this team being not that close to being competitive. And I asked kind of where where is this team? And he said, we're still in the earlier stages 
uh, because there's still so much left to prove with this group. And and he he specifically singled out that he said, you know, in, in the last three years, we've invested in young players. Shaden Sharp in the, in the draft at seven, Scoot Anderson in the draft at three, Don McClingan in the draft at seven. And until those guys take a step and start playing, and this is a quote, start playing winning basketball, we're not going to play at the level we need to. And I think that gives you a sense of kind of where the, where this team is. They're committed to the youth. They're committed to the youngsters. They're committed to the draft picks they've made. Um, when you end up top 10 in the NBA draft three consecutive years and you make your picks and particularly like, you know, we just haven't seen a ton of Shaden Sharp, but he was like, a you know, drafted straight out of high school. He was going to demand patience. Uh, Scoot Henderson drafted straight out of the G League, didn't play college basketball. He played pro ball, but like Ignite is a different, a different beast. Um, he was not supposed to take time, but it's clear he's going to take some time. And, and, and Klingon... I don't think he's going to be a finished product, although he might be effective at some things as a rookie. And 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 Cronin said it's like basically what what the difference is and where where how they go from where they are to where they want to be is those guys go from flashes and he said or a, a good five game stretch, which is very specifically a reference to Shaden Sharp, to consistency. And 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 that's kind of what we've been talking about here on the show is like this this group just the youngsters have some tools and have shown you some promise, but they aren't you know the difference between bench players and starters is consistency the bench the difference between starters and and really good players is consistency and the difference from good to great players is consistency how many nights a week are you your best and how many nights a week do you reach levels that nobody does like that's that's the difference and nba guys um i i thought cronin's honesty was not surprising but in some ways refreshing because he can this is a totally comfortable time of year to bs um a listener sent me a um a, an email today uh when they had written a long sort of essay about how september was the time of year to be um delusional and it, it is that's that's true it is the time of year to be delusional and i i think joe crona nobody would have been i mean i would have because i that's what i do i complain a little bit in the microphone but like he could have been a lot rosier about their position. We're really good. We're going to surprise some people. I know everyone thinks we're going to be the worst team in the Western Conference, but I I really like this group. And he did say he likes this group, right? We we love what we have and we love where we're headed. But he wasn't he was refreshingly just straightforward about like this team's not very good. We're not very good right now. And we um and we know we're not going to be very good. And I asked him about kind of the balance between, it's like, you know, you. I asked him about running it back, basically. 13 players return. You add Denny Avdia, you add Donovan Klingon, the other 13 players all return. You add Justin Minai, another two-way guy. It's 14 returning players on the roster on a team that won 21 games last year. And part of his reasoning, um, which I don't know if I totally buy, but part of his reasoning is that they, like, they value the cohesion and connectiveness. They value that. But he also admitted that last year they got such little data and they got so little clarity about what they were that that I think that kind of is a reason for it. It's like, well, we don't it doesn't it probably doesn't behoove us to punt on this because we know so little. Um, and some of the you know, you know the top tier young guys wouldn't move anyway. So you're just talking about the vets. And I think the real truth is they didn't get um, enough interest in the veterans and they didn't actively shop. Amphrey Simons in any meaningful way that to, to sort of see what that would be like. You know, I'm sure they t they took phone calls, obviously, but I don't think they said, like, we want to trade him and set out to do so and then didn't find deals. I think they did with Jeremy Grant. I think they pretty clearly engaged the Lakers to to a, a pretty far down the line, but just never it never it never got real because the Lakers weren't willing to offer and the and the Blazers had a high high asking price. The Lakers weren't willing to offer multiple picks, which is totally reasonable, and the Blazers had a high asking price, which is um I don't know if it's reasonable, but it's what they chose to do this time. And and Cronin talked about that. He said that there were he, they 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 talked deals, but there was no real traction to the point where it was like really happening. But he also talked about how and, and Jeremy Grant mentioned this as well is that they were in, they you know Cronin was very very honest and open and transparent about what was happening, and then and Grant declined to comment on what those talks were and what transparency meant. But to me, my read on that is that um, he said, Jeremy, I'm going to try to trade you because you're not part our long-term plan, but I'm not going to send you to Siberia. Um, or where did Nermal get sent to? I, I, I want to say Abu Dhabi, but wherever Nermal got sent to, shout out to my Garfield heads, my real Garfield heads listening. Um, like, 
he's not going to normal Jeremy Grant. He's going to send him, if he trades him, he's going to send him to somewhere he would like to go, for the most part, unless you're Malcolm Brogdon or Damian Lillard, Joe Cronin has sent you where you want to go. Um, and and then I think this is the quote, and this is the most meaning to me, this is the most meaningful quote of, of, um, of the Joe Cronin presser. And I asked him kind of about, you know, he, he talked about the luxury of patience. I asked like, okay, yeah, I think, I bet you do have the luxury of patience. When does that run out? Like when, when does you have to see substantive results for what you've done? And he said that they're committed to doing this the right way. And then he said the following, we don't want to skip major steps to lower our ceiling. And to me, that is what this season is about. If you were looking for a, a, a kind of, um, an ethos or a or um, a guiding light that came out of media day. This wasn't a big, heavy branding, flashing lights type of thing. But this is the money quote from Cronin. We don't want to skip major steps to lower our ceiling. They don't want to cut corners. They want to lose like hell and get Cooper flag. He didn't say that, right? I'm, 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 I am putting a lot of inference into those words, and I'm sure some of you who are staunchly anti-tanking are hoping that I am just misreading this, um, and others have their other opinions. But I, but I, I, I think there's, um, to me, the read is on this is we don't want to skip major steps and lower our ceiling. They don't want to cut corners. They don't want to be kind of good and end up in the middle. If they're going to be as bad as they've been last year, and this is their second, this is their first, like, this is year two of an earnest rebuild after the first season. The two prior years with Damian Lord and Toe, they were doing this sneak rebuild, right? Sneak tank. Sneak rebuild, run Dame out of town plan. This is like, hey, we got rid of them. Um, now we're going to like truly build up from the bottom. And the, and the, we don't want to skip steps to me just says like, listen, we're going to be young. We're going to, we, we know that our future is tied to getting our draft picks, right? We've made a lot of investment in Shane Sharp, a lot of investment in Scoot Henderson. Now we've made a lot of investment in Donovan Klingon. We believe we got those picks, right? We can't, we can't rush them, but they need to get better. It's on them to improve because that's how the NBA works. Players need to get better. You put them in the right situation and they improve. And But we can't rush it. We can't skip steps. And that means to me, this year, this team's going to stink again. And Joe Cron was pretty honest that this team was going to stink again. You knew that, right? You knew that because you follow this team closely and you listen to Locked on Blazers. But I think it was laid bare for you by the GM. He didn't push back when reporters talked about how this team wasn't designed to win or how they were going to lose a bunch of games or how, you know, they were in a rebuild. He says, we're, we're still in the earlier stages of the rebuild and we're not going to skip steps. This is a team that is committed to their path and their path is going to be a pretty challenging one this year for fans, but it's a path that they, this is what they want to do. This is their plan. Whether it's going to work, whether it is, re, whether it is a good plan, I think is something that we will have the benefit of hindsight of judging, but I think it's pretty clear what this path is. This is a team that wants to finish at the bottom because they know that finishing at the bottom is their best path to the top. Okay, let's talk news. That's what Joe Cronin said. I think those remarks are super important. Um, when the when the biggest decision makers speak, I think it's really important to pay attention to what they say. Uh, I wish we'd gotten another 15 minutes of Joe Cronin because we would have learned more stuff. Uh, and I, I, I honestly believe fans deserve a ton of transparency from executives um, and particularly fans of bad teams particularly fans of bad teams. If you're a, if you're investing a lot of like emotional interest in the Blazers, um, 35 minutes of Joe Cronin transparency. Here's the plan. Here's why we did it. Here's their answers to every single question you could possibly want. You deserve that because um, if you're investing in a team that is going to lose 55 times, you deserve you deserve answers to everything you could possibly be curious about, about by the lead decision makers. Uh, shout out to Knicks fans who don't actually believe that. <laughs> You know who you are, you weirdos. Um, okay, let's talk. Let's talk news. There was some real news surrounding Rob Williams. Is he like? Is he back? It kind of sounds like he's getting darn close. Join me in that second segment, won't you? First, though, I want to tell you that today's show is brought to you by FanDuel. It's America's number one sports book, and right now, FanDuel wants to hook it up. They want to hook it up because it's NFL season, and 
they got a they got a great setup for you. Uh, say I am recording this after I watched the Monday Night Football games. I just I just watched the Lions and Jared Goff throw a perfect game. And to beat the Seahawks. Um, and, you know, you might be like me. You might watch a little bit of football your own self. And if you are during NFL season, if you're watching the games, you can pull up the FanDuel app and right there on the app in the middle of the game, you got a hunch you want to live bet games. Well, right there in the app, they got the latest stats. They got live play by play and so much more. And it's all on the same page where you place your bet. So you can be a maximally informed voter with your second screen or if you're watching on multiple screens on your ancillary screen. And if you want to get started today, if you're a first-time FanDuel user, you get $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. That's $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet, and that's FanDuel.com. All right. So we had some news from from Media Day. There wasn't a ton of news. This wasn't a news-heavy Media Day, but we got a little bit of news first. The Blazers got a new uh, jersey sponsor. I don't care about this one little bit. Um, I'm, I am I don't I don't want ads on on my NBA jerseys. I want ads on any jerseys, but I certainly don't want ads on my NBA jerseys. I even think the Maker's Mark is too big with the Nike Maker's Mark. Like it's too it's too big and too prominent. The Jordan Brand one is a little bit too prominent on the on those on the alternate jerseys. Um, it's a local Windows company, Brightside Windows. Who cares? I think the most important part about this uh, branding is that it's the same colors as the Blazers. It's red and black, and so it looks less outrageous on the jersey. That's good news. The other bit of news, who? I mean, like, yay. Okay, you're going to see an ad on the jerseys. Um, it's for a window company. The Blazers released a press release, and the subhead or the second sub on the press release was that this was the first Windows company to sponsor a jersey in North American sports. I believe that. I believe that. That sounds true to me. I'm not going to I'm not going to double check the subhead on the press release. I believe this is the first Windows company to sponsor a jersey in North American professional sports. Um here's the real news though. Rob Williams cleared to play 5 on 5. He's been playing 5 on 5 in pickup for about 3 weeks. Um you know, I mentioned this on previous pods. Labor Day is like about when NBA guys get back in the gym. Uh so it's like August is a sacred month of travel for NBA folks. And then young players and vets, you know, young players particularly trickle in around Labor Day. Maybe some young guys are already here slightly before that, but like you'll get the majority of the team around Labor Day. And then that first couple weeks of September, everybody gets back. And then the last dudes trickle in right before Labor Day at the end of September. But you get a bulk of your of your crew there early and play and pick up. Um, you, you can basically run um NBA practices in in September prior to training camp like you can work on stuff and you can install stuff the only difference is you cannot fine anyone for being late you cannot no one can get in trouble for not attending because the season hasn't started that's like the collectively bargained part of it but you can like why guys get there early is because you can they play a bunch of pickup and they can go through some stuff and talk to coaches and be at the facility and you do all of those things um but no one can be fined for lack of attendance that's that is the difference between September and October now we're in October you can now you got to show up you got two days now 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 there's rules but so Rob's been playing Five and five for for uh, about three weeks. Um, Joe Cronin said that that Rob is not fully cleared, like no restrictions, no nothing. But he is playing five on five, and he will be um, he he will continue to ramp up, and his partici- participation level in practice um, will 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 increase a little bit. He's not fully one hundred percent you know, take, you know, take off the governor and let him go type of thing. Like he is still being monitored, but playing five on five is as, you know, as close as you can get from the full, full health. And Rob Williams was the, was, um, I believe the last one to talk to us. He was in the, at the end of the day. I, I don't have, I don't have the timeline totally correct, maybe in my head, but he was great. Rob Williams is great. He's great on the microphone. He's such a compelling personality. Um, he's so honest and like authentically himself. Um, you, there's no like facade or anything. And, and even when he doesn't want to answer questions, he's just like, he, he was really, really good for selfish reasons. I hope Rob Williams is like a part of the Blazers for a long time. Um, I doubt he will be. Cause I just like, I, I understand how the business of the NBA works, but, um, I really enjoyed him. If you haven't gone and watched the interview, go check it out on YouTube. He's, he's, he's freaking really good. Um, but he was so earnest about his situation. Like, 
said, it's been a long seven months. And if you saw me walking around today, I was smiling because there were times months ago when I couldn't even walk. And I, I think there is part of him that is out to prove that he can, he's still that guy. And so I, I asked him about it, right? I, I said, like, are you anxious to play, to kind of like show everybody that you're still there? And he said, yeah, but not like an anxious, like a nervousness, but he's just anxious. He just really is itching to play. He's, there's an anxiety about getting back out on the floor and playing NBA basketball again. And I asked him if there's been a moment when he's been playing pickup over the last three weeks, if he's been like, Rob Wilback, Time Lord. I can't imagine he calls himself Time Lord. But if there's been a moment um, over the last three weeks where he's like felt like himself. And he mentioned that he dunked on one of his teammates. And I asked him to name names and he said, I can't do him like that. I can't. He's like, like, come on. I just chose not to say his name. I'm not going to tell you who it is. But he said he dunked on a teammate. And then he offered another anecdote. He said he got he got Amphrey Simons on a switch. And Ant kind of isolated him out on the perimeter. And he started to... Um, he started to, to, to kind of be able to move laterally and stay with a guard and do the things that made Rob Williams special. Obviously, he was a great, he's, a, he's a good passer. He was a good, he was a really good lob guy, lob Williams for, for if you're nasty. Um, like he, he was, he was a good lob guy and a good passer on offense, but on defense, he was, a, he was a good shot blocker, really good weak side helper. But what made him special is that he also could guard in space. And what made those, um, Celtic team specials, they could play big with him and, uh, and, and Al Horford, but like not get beat up by little guys in space. I, I think especially in the 2022 finals, uh, Rob Williams' ability to guard in space against, uh, against the Warriors was like really on display. It's like, yeah, this dude's, this dude can play. And he said he caught Amphrey Simons in space and, and, and Ant got him on a switch and he pulled him out and Ant, you know, took a step back three and hit it. And he said he hit it, but it was good defense. It's good defense. And that made him feel like himself. That he could guard a guard, contest a shot, make him take a tough shot, and then if he hits it and you live with it, you tip your cap. That's the life of someone who plays defense. The ball goes in more than you want it to, but you can only you just do your best. I'm rooting for Rob Williams. I'm rooting for anyone to come back. He's played 41 games out of the last two years. He's had surgeries on both knees. He played six games last year, um, and and you know contemplated a, a, a couple different surgery routes that maybe would have let him get back on the court sooner, but chose a longer one with a longer rehab and seven months of grinding and didn't get cleared to play five on five basketball till September, which means he spent an entire summer not playing during the off season, not really playing, training, rehab, getting right, but not playing basketball ball he's itching to play again i'm excited for him, i'm rooting for him and that's the big news coming out of of media day and why this is news is because it it does make things a little bit tricky i also asked rob williams if he had discussions about what his role would be he said you don't really like when you're you know basically like when you're you, when you're into the league as far as i am like when you're when you're a veteran like i am you don't really discuss what your role is like you're just going to do what you do which i think is a great point players play <laughs> it's a great point um but but I, you know, for clarity, I was trying to like, so you assume that when you're healthy, you'll play every night. Once you're clear to go, you'll play every night. And he, he, he stopped a little bit short of that, but he basically said, yeah, I assume that when I'm ready to go, I'll be, I'll be like, when I'm fully cleared, I'll be, I'll just be going and playing and kind of, I'll be that, I'll, I'll be on the court because they'll need me because I help and because I'm good. That puts a slight wrinkle into things because if Rob Williams is healthy, um, he's, probably has to play in front of Donovan Klingon just for like realistic purposes, which means that there are going to be nights where Donovan Klingon straight up does not play. Either the Blazers go 10 deep and play two bigs, either Klingon with Aiden or more likely Klingon with Rob Williams, um, or, the, or Klingon just like doesn't play some nights, or they play 10 guys but a couple really short shifts for the two backup bigs with Williams and Klingon. Um, I don't think it's like a huge deal if Donovan Klingon spends 35 games kind of like out of the rotation his rookie year, but it's not ideal. It's not ideal for the level of team the Blazers are. Um, it, it, for most rookies, it, I don't think it matters, right? On, on competitive teams, I don't believe rookies like need to play or have to play, but like on, the Blazers are a little bit different. Like I don't care if Rob Dillingham plays for the T-Wolves, but like um, the Blazers, you know, if you're going to be bad um, and you're going to be a team that's in a rebuild not carving out minutes for your seventh overall pick in the draft is a little odd. It's, it's odd, but I mean, it's kind of just like life. They kind of need Rob Williams to prove that he can play and then trade him and, and, and kind of like move on. They, they kind of, they can't skip these steps. Right. And to quote Joe Cronin, um, it puts them in an, an interesting spot, but um, we'll see how that plays out. I think that's an interesting thing to track and see what it looks like. 
let's talk odds and ends. I think there was some fun stuff that happened at Media Day. I want to I want to tell you my uh, five, six, seven favorite things from Media Day. Join me in that third segment, won't you? Still a pass first point guard. I'm still Mike Richmond, and you are still listening to Locked On Blazers. Some odds and ends from Media Day. I really enjoyed it. I really, really enjoyed the uh, the Rob Williams interview. Go check that out. Uh, I really enjoyed Matisse Thibel's interview. He's just he's just a really interesting person to talk to. He is so thoughtful and so um, measured, and he's really listens to questions and is considerate of what the question was and says, okay, how do I want to answer this? Thoughtful about how, how he puts words together. He is unique. I don't think there's a lot of NBA dudes like Matisse Thibel, but off the court or on the court, on the court, he's unique too. He's a weird player. He's you know so honest. He's like, the only critiques I ever hear about my game are on offense. So if I'm going to work on my game, it has to be on offense. Like that is such an honest and open way to talk about yourself as an NBA player. But he also talked, and I thought this was um, really eye-opening, about kind of how hurt he was to not make the Australian national team and get cut from the Olympic roster. He said that he maybe uh, learned a little bit about his own sense of entitlement because he just assumed that he was guaranteed to make the roster and was stunned when he didn't. And when a reporter asked him kind of how, how did you deal with that? He said, I dealt with that by getting a flight. And then I took a 15 hour flight home and spent a lot of time thinking about it on the plane and in airports. And that's the truth, right? It's like it, 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 he was very, and then he kind of caught himself and said, there's more like, that's, that's not a simple that's just not that simple of a question. There's more to it than that. It was, I thought, I thought, I thought Matisse was great. Um, great interview. Everybody loves Denny. Everybody loves Denny. I think, um, Chauncey Billups talked about, uh, Denny Avdia and he mentioned that like Denny just plays with like a passion and an intensity and an intensity to play the right way. That means making the right pass. If guys open, swing it to him. Um, making the right, you know, making the right reads, making the right play and, and, you know, playing hard. And he said like, and, and he, he believes in diving on the floor and going after loose balls. And when other guys don't play that way, he lets them know. And it was kind of a, like, Denny Avdi has an intensity and I've seen him cuss his teammates out and I love it. And I, I think that's, the Blazers need that. They need Denny's versatility, but they also just need like, they need a little fire. I think there were times last year, like where they played hard, but times last year where they just, it, the fire wasn't there. Or not even like they didn't, it wasn't that they weren't playing hard. So they missed the sort of that emotional core. That's someone who is going to be like a tone setter in terms of like um, intensity. It's hard to do that if you're not one of the really good players. And Denny Avdi has a chance to be one of the Blazers' very best players this season. And if he brings that intensity, it'll be really interesting. Um, if he can kind of, you know, um, if he if, if he can bring up the sort of the rest of the group's uh, RPMs, if he can get him to rev a little bit hotter because of the way he plays and kind of the the, the example he sets. And and his teammates were com- were really complimenting of him, talking about his versatility, talking about um, Matisse Seibel talked about what a physical offensive player he was and how there's just that is very rare of guys who are physical on offense as opposed to physical on defense. Um, th- Every Simons talks about how much easier Denny is going to make his his life because he can be an on ball guy and and then kind of take some be a pressure release valve. Um, Tumani Kamara talked about like how much Denny is going to be a compliment to him on defense. They love Denny. Folks love Denny. Uh, I I think that was evident, and we'll see. Um, you know, something to track throughout the year. It's like it does it is you know I've mentioned this in the past. It's like the best version of Denny Avdia checks so many boxes for what the Blazers need in terms of skills. Um, and I think his teammates are seeing that in pickup in September and they're like, yo, he's going to help us do so many things. And I, I think that'll be interesting to track is like, does that, um, does the Denny effect make everybody better or do they just kind of like appreciate him? And, and you kind of see like hey, really, really helpful player. Um, it, it'll be interesting. I, I but it, early re- reviews, people, people are loving it. The other, the other guy that, you know, people are asked about a bunch of the new guys, there's only two new guys on the team. So it's like, what are your impressions of like literally the only two new, new coworkers you have? Um, a lot of a lot of compliments for Donovan Klingon, but a lot of compliments in the way you compliment a young player. I think it's very different in the way that you hear compliments for Denny. It's like, oh man, he's like dude can hoop, right? He's entering his fifth season versus DC versus what they call him, Donovan Klingon. They call him DC. Um, not a very creative nickname, but that's life. They're going, but most of his colleagues were calling him DC, and they're saying that he's just like he's really good, and once he learns how to play the game, he's going to be so much better. Um, you know, Rob Williams said it's like he's already talented, but he's he's got so much to learn, and he's so excited to learn. And 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 DeAndre Ayton uh, echoed that, and Jeremy Grant said like, oh yeah, he's really talented, and his he's learning the game, and once and as and it's so I'm, I'm you know I'm excited to watch him continue to learn the game type of thing. Um, people are excited about about uh, DC. 
Chief among them, probably probably DeAndre Ayton. And DeAndre Ayton was friggin' upbeat. He was he was juiced in his interview. Quite literally juiced. A reporter said, You have the most energy of anyone who's come in here. What's your what's going on? And he said, Oh, you gotta sleep good, you gotta drink your water, you gotta drink your juices, things of that nature. Which is like an incredibly <laughs> um an incredibly literal response to why do you have so much energy? I've slept well. I'm well hydrated, and I have and I've had my nutrition my nutritious juices to begin the day. Um, very little answer, literal answer. I asked I asked DA what kind of juice are you drinking. He said beet juice, ginger juice, cleanses things of that nature. Um, <laughs> uh, I I've actually seen like uh, Matisse Thibel and Jeremy Grant would drink these turmeric carrot juices after games turmeric carrot ginger juices after games in little shots and they would toast them and take shots of the these wellness juices after games so it was um uh, a, a classic locker room ritual i saw many a time i can't believe no one wrote about it last year but th- that's life um but uh I, I guess there's a lot of juices in blazer land is what i'm trying to say but da had the juice like he was he was uh, outside um Outside media room as he was walking in, he, he he saw he spotted Donovan Klingon who was who was signing autographs at his little table and he gave DC a big hug. And then he just said he's so excited to play with him and learn from him and show him all of these things. Um and you know, I recall last year when Donovan when when DeAndre Ayton was like so jazzed up at Media Day, right? Like he had so much juice. And then literally the first practice the next day after, he had a really awkward interaction with reporters about not wanting to talk about the Phoenix Suns. Maybe it wasn't the next day, but it was like uh, it was right when they got back to, to Portland. I guess they went away for a week and he got back. So it was it was but like it was like his his two interviews, his back to back interviews in Portland, I should say, were like really, really weird um, ends of the spectrum. So I'm not going to say like D.A. is like a totally changed man and his in and his and his energy is all these things. But like, he had really positive vibes. He had really positive vibes today. And he mentioned in his comments, and I think this was interesting, that playing for the Bahamas really showed um showed him kind of what he needed to be. And he, he mentioned about unlocking the three-level beast. Um, we'll see what that means. But he, he mentioned a couple of things. So the playing in the Olympics enhanced everything I wanted to be. Uh, creating off the dribble, uh, creating contact, and getting to the line. That's what I want to see. I don't care if De- I like. I'd like to see DeAndre Ayton shoot threes, but what if he like attacks the rim off the bounce with the intent of getting fouled and creates contact with the intent of getting fouled? He kind of it was like a question. Hey, what was the experience like playing for the Bahamas? And he mentioned that it like unlocked all of the skills that he wants to show, which is creating more off the dribble, creating being more physical on offense, and getting himself to the free throw line. That's the freaking dream right there for DA. And that was kind of like a weird throwaway tucked in another answer, but like a very earnest and honest ball answer. And I was, um, it was like, oh, okay, okay, DA. Now you're, you're seeing the vision. Um, but he was, he was, um, he had a lot, he had a lot of positive vibes and he was wearing like a, uh, like he's wearing like a, you know, a chain, right? Like he's wearing like a, a diamond necklace or like a, uh, a, you know, platinum chain, but it was kind of like in the way of, um, uh, a charm bracelet. It was kind of like a charm bracelet, except uh, except chain style. It was, um, it was like quite quite the adornment. Um, real real jewelry um, for for Da. Speaking of like real basketball stuff, Scoot Henderson had kind of a really bizarre start to his interview where he's like, "What do you remember from last season?" And he said, "The food." And then like once we got beyond like the thing I'll remember, I take away most from last season is the meals I ate, which was a truly bizarre re- response. Um, he talked about changing how he plays mechanically and getting more fluid in his hips so he's more explosive. This was lost in kind of a, the rest of his interview, but boy, if that means that Scoot Henderson plays better and stronger off two feet, that would be a huge improvement in his game. Like these are little basketball things that I kind of caught tucked in, tucked into larger conversations. But if DA plays with more intention to be physical and Scoot has uh, sort of, uh, as I flip through my notes to see what he talks about, he's He goes, more intact mechanics and how I move. That's what he focused on this summer. Moving stronger through my hips. Like if he's more explosive playing off two feet because because he focuses on his mechanical, like the way he loads up and gets into jump shots. Uh, that's good news from Scoot. That's going to be a different Scoot. So th- those um, those were some of my some of my absolute favorite uh, favorite moments from from this one. These are the sort of the odds and ends. I thought that was I thought that was really good. Uh, and then the last one. 
It's a classic muscle watch, baby. Uh, DeAndre Ayton, again, he was jazzed. He was so hyped up. So he walks in, and there's a mannequin that's displaying the new jersey with the new um, the new sponsor. And he goes, he's like, uh, he's like, oh yeah, it's a really like um, wide framed, very like barrel chested mannequin. Like the mannequin is jacked as hell. And and DA says like, oh, it looks like Tumani. Tumani put on like Tumani put on twenty pounds of muscle. Which is like such a classic media day thing to say someone that put on 20 pounds of muscle and in the best shape of their lives. And so when Tumani came up to the podium, I was like, hey man, DA says you put on 20 pounds of muscle. And and Tumani was like, 20 pounds is a lot. <laughs> 20 pounds, I didn't put on 20 pounds of muscle. 20 pounds is a lot. It's more like 10. And I think that's the perfect encapsulation of media day. Folks are excited. There's optimism. And there might be a little bit exaggerated. They might be a little bit exaggerated. Might be doubling the amount of muscle they put on. They might want to play faster. We're going to be the blah 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 mostest team ever. You might not be the mostest, bestest, estest, istest thing that there could ever be. But this is the time for optimism. This is the time for delusion. This is the time for a little bit of positivity. And while I think the leading, the leading decision maker, the GM, was very, very earnest and honest about the position of the team. There was, there was a let's get it rolling vibe from from the rest of the team, particularly the youngsters and the sort of not about to get traded Jeremy Grants and Avery Simons of the world. Um, it's here. Media Day is the beginning of the season, and now it's here. Tuesday marks the first practice of the season. The Blazers are going to be in town for that practice, and we are 10 days away from the first preseason game. Get excited. I'm excited it's here. Um, you know what's also here is Locked on Blazers, five days a week wherever you get podcasts and also on YouTube. I appreciate you listening. I'll talk to you soon.